Well, we want to kick off this evening uh, by telling you that uh, we're pleased to have you here. Again, my name is Marty Kusing, I'm past master of Burlingame Lodge number 400 out in Burlingame, California. Whenever you're in the area, please come and join us. Uh, before I turn the virtual four over to our worshipful master for other introductions, I would like to start uh, uh, with a prayer uh, to our uh, great architect. I am also the chaplain of our lodge, uh, so if you may be able to join us uh, wherever you are in a silent, in a quick prayer. Great architect of the universe, we humbly invoke your blessing upon this webinar this evening. We pray that any brothers or friends that may be um, still waiting to join us, wherever they may be, uh, keep them safe in their travels. We pray for all those suffering from fires, from health concerns, uh, and for our servicemen and service women um, stationed afar and near to protect us during this time. We humbly pray uh, for our presenter tonight, most worshipful John Cooper. We pray that the words that he speaks out of his mouth and his lips bring about wisdom to our ears and all this we humbly pray amen so <laughs> well it's my pleasure uh, to bring forth um, our MC for this evening worshipful Roberto Diaz the floor is yours thank you Marty good evening brethren and guests and welcome to Burlingame Lodge number 400 first Masonic guest speaker presentation we're very, very pleased to have you here with us. My name is Roberto Diaz Jr. And I am the Worshipful Master of Burlingame Lodge number 400 in Burlingame, California. This evening, we not only have many lodges from California, but also a lodge from the Grand Lodge of Puerto Rico joining us. A great big fraternal welcome to all. Joining us tonight in our group of panelists, we have Worshipful Brother David Jolliffe, Worshipful Brother Cam, APAC and Worshipful Brother Chris D. Smith, Inspector of the 153rd Masonic District. Thank you, gentlemen. This being our first speaker for our lodge, uh, uh, we felt that it would be most appropriate to kick off our series of presentations with one of our very own. So without further ado, brethren, it is my great pleasure in honor to introduce Most Worshipful John L. Cooper III. Most Worshipful Cooper is a past Grand Secretary of the Masonic Grand Lodge of California, having served for almost 18 years when he retired in 2008. In 2013-2014, he served as Grand Master of Masons in California. He holds a PhD in education from Claremont Graduate School and before becoming Grand Secretary, held various teaching and administrative posts in the public schools of California. A Mason since 1964, and is both a 33rd degree Mason in the Scottish Rite and a Knight of the York Grand Cross of Honor in the York Rite. His primary interest in Freemasonry has been the history and philosophies of the craft. And he has been presented numerous papers of international conferences, including Bordeaux, France in 2019. In 2019, he also served as Master of Harmony Lodge number 164 at Sierra City on the 50th anniversary of service as master, as the master of his mother lodge in Los Angeles in 1969. He has also served as master of both Northern and Southern California research lodges and is currently the Master of Golden Compasses Research Lodge at Sacramento. Most Worshipful John, during his Masonic journey, has served as Master an incredible total of seven times and is a member of 11 lodges. We are proud to say that he is also a life member of Burlingame Lodge number 400. Most Worshipful Cooper will be presenting this evening Thomas Starking, the Mason who, served Cal who saved California for the Union. Most Worshipful John, the virtual floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Worshipful Master, for that very kind introduction. And 
Brother and all, welcome to uh, sharing some thoughts that I thought might be of interest to you and very pleased to have our panelists be able to interact afterwards and I understand that other questions and things are also available from them. So let me, if I can, share the screen here uh, and bring to you the presentation that I put together for us this evening, which is, if I can make this work well, there we are. A topic, a talk that I have entitled Thomas Starr King, a Masonic hero, almost forgotten. And I hope through this evening to share some things about this remarkable individual that I think is well worth remembering. So let's begin. Thomas Starr King was born in 1824 and he died in 1864 in San Francisco, California. The journey along the way was a, a remarkable experience and his impact on people was far beyond from what many people actually remember today. But in California, we have a very unique connection and a Masonic connection to Thomas Starr King, which we should never forget. If you go up to the California State Capitol, there is a bronze statue of our brother Thomas Starr King. This particular statue once represented California in the United States Capitol. And was brought back to California after that statue was replaced by a statue of President Ronald Reagan. The other statue um, there is of uh, the founder of our missions in California, Father Junipero Serra. Each state in the United States is entitled to have two statutes two statues in the United States Capitol. And it's up to the state legislature in each state as to whom that will be. Our two were represented from approximately with Thomas Starr King from approximately 1931 until the statue was returned to California in 2009. I wanna talk about the year of his birth and about these three individuals, two of whom were Freemasons at the beginning of our story. Thomas Starr King was born in 1824. There have been three presidential elections in our history that have brought our nation to a frenzied peak of uncertainty and division. The first of these was the year in which Thomas Starr King was born, 1824. The second was the November 1860 election, which was the precursor to the secession of the Southern states, the formation of the Confederacy and the Civil War. The third will occur next month. And I'd like you to think through in terms of how events focus and shape things beyond that. And I won't be saying anything about our November election. You and I will have to go through that experience uh, next month to find out whether or not my prediction that it will be the third of the most momentous elections in American history. But this first one in 1824 did involve two Masons and one man who was adamantly opposed to Freemasonry. The United States Constitution provides that electors for the president of the United States shall be appointed in a manner determined by each state legislature. Of course, you and I know that over time, that power to select has been delegated to the popular vote within each state. But the Constitution, which was written in 1787, also provided that if the electoral vote was uncertain, unclear, or did not result in a clear majority, that the United States House of Representatives would make the decision. And if you've been following current news and items and things like that, you know that we have been talking about what would happen 
if that were the case this year. In 1824, there were four candidates for president and that threw the election into the House of Representatives because there was not a clear winner of all of those four candidates. One of the candidates was Andrew Jackson, whose picture is in the center. Another of those candidates was John Quincy Adams. His picture is in the upper left. John Quincy Adams was the son of our second president, John Adams, and a prominent figure in his own right. Andrew Jackson, of course, needs no introduction to Americans nowadays. You can take a $20 bill out of your wallet and see his picture every time. But not so many Americans remember the one on the lower right hand who was Henry Clay. And curiously enough, just from the Masonic perspective, Andrew Jackson was Grandmaster of the Grand Lodge of Tennessee and Henry Clay had been Grandmaster of the Grand Lodge of Kentucky. Now, we are used to speaking in Freemasonry of the importance of brotherly love, but I should tell you that these two Masons hated one another with a bitter passion. And the beginning of that essentially was the election of 1824. Henry Clay was able to get John Quincy Adams elected as president rather than Andrew Jackson. When Jackson really thought he should have won the election in the first place. And out of that bitter experience, these two prominent past grandmasters developed a lasting hatred which only ended with the death of each one. I want you to think back just a moment into the history that led up to the 1824 because it's not only the beginning of Thomas Starr King's life, but the beginning of the story that we need to understand as we look at the importance of what Thomas Starr King began. Now, I want to take you back to your days as an 11th grader in high school and your United States history class. Uh, some of you may have had the opportunity to take more advanced courses in college in American history, and therefore you have more knowledge than most Americans do, but most Americans' understanding of history is what they learned in high school. This is a map of the United States just at the beginning of our story. If you recall, the predecessor of the United States Constitution, the Articles of Confederation, did not work very well. And as a result, the United States Constitution replaced it when it was ratified by the requisite number of states in 1789. The Constitution was written in the summer of 1787. And the man who presided over that was, of course, George Washington. And George Washington was a Freemason, a very proud Freemason. Benjamin Franklin was one of the key participants in that. And Benjamin Franklin was not only a prominent Freemason, but a past Grand Master of the Provincial Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania. If you look at that, the eastern states on the seaboard had claims to lands stretching to the west, to the western boundary of the then United States. And that was the Mississippi River. One of the successes of the Articles of Confederation, despite all its failures, was that the eastern seaboard states gave up their claims to what were then called the western lands and these areas territories and eventually states were admitted to the original union on an equal basis and that's a very important point because part of our story is going to involve the expansion of this beginning of the united states westward and what it created in terms of our political structure and struggles. In 1803, the United States doubled its size when under President Thomas Jefferson, the territory west of the Mississippi River was purchased from France. And this territory became an important part of our story. 
before we look at the western boundary of the new United States, which is roughly the mark between what is called in this map, Spanish possessions and Oregon country, the green territory, the pink state of Missouri and the orange Arkansas territory are important to understand for the next stage of our discussion. It became popular for a while in American history classes to downplay the importance of slavery in American history. I can well recall when I was in high school in 1950 that the view generally prevalent then was that the Civil War was caused by economic disparity between the North and the South, and that slavery really, really was not uh, an important factor. Thankfully, historians have done a better job of writing the ship since then. And we understand that this issue of slavery and its expansion in the United States was absolutely crucial to understanding the major issues that shaped this country. If you look at this map, the states that are below, that are in pink, below what was called the Mason-Dixon line were states that were that permitted slavery, in fact, was a part of what they were as a political entity. The green, light green territory above were uh, areas of the United States states and, and a territory where slavery did not exist. That's a kind of a complex story, and I certainly don't have time tonight to go into the details of that. But by 1820, the beginning of, of where this map is, um, the issue of what you would do with slavery as new states were admitted to the union was an absolutely critical issue because the states were evenly balanced in the United States Senate. And as a result, if you added one more state to one side or the other, you would have added the balance of power to the other. In 1820, a compromise to bring Missouri into the union as a slave state was successfully passed because a decision was made at the same time to bring the state of Maine, which I'll use with my arrow up here to see if I can show you that, was split off from Massachusetts and brought in as a free state. That seemed to settle the issue for at least one generation, from 1820 to approximately the years leading up to 1850. I won't go into the details about that, but if you look at this unusually shaped piece of territory called Spanish possessions, you will note that this is the current state of Texas. And if you remember your history, in 1836, there was a rebellion fomented by Americans who were in Texas against the Republic of Mexico, and Texas became an independent nation, the Republic of Texas. The Mexican War, the war that in the next decade that occurred with Mexico was essentially started by Americans in Texas who wanted to join the Union. And if you look at the, the area here below the line that's drawn, it obviously would come in as a slave state. And that begged the question about this balance between North and South that would be a problem from all of them. Let's go to the next one here. So on the eve of the Civil War, this map represents basically what the problem was and the opportunity for the man, man and the Mason, Thomas Starr King. If you look at the yellow in the south, you have the area that represented the slave states, including the state of Missouri, and you have the green above that, which essentially represented the free territory or proposed free territory. The problem was California. If California came into the union, it would come in as a free state. That was at least the understanding. But how would you deal with that if it would unhinge the rest of the agreement? So in, in 1850, Congress worked out a series of measures that compensated for California coming into the Union as a free state. And those compromises included things such as an agreement that 
slaves who were freeing were fleeing from the south were fugitives would be returned to their owners in the southern part of the country it includes several other uh, provisions of that but that one the fugitive slave act was one of the ones that caused the most anger in the northern states because they by this point profoundly believed that slavery was wrong was immoral and that if a man or a woman succeeded in reaching freedom in these northern states that they should not be bound to return them i'll just call your attention to the unorganized territory in the center up here and the oregon territory out here and then the state of california which came into the union in 1850 won't be touching tonight on these other intermediate territories. However, I do want to call your attention, because it's an important part of the story, to where the, the uh, part of the map with the arrow is here, which is to the west of the state of Missouri. This, at the time, uh, from 1850, was organizing into a territory called Kansas, and to the north of that, a territory that would ultimately be called Nebraska. The Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 essentially had a simple solution, they thought, to the problem of how to admit new states. And what they hit upon was the idea of popular sovereignty. Why not let the citizens that were in those territories requesting to become a state vote whether they should be a slave state or a free state. Well, in the case of Kansas, that was an absolute and unmitigated disaster because there were not sufficient people in Kansas to vote on one side or the other. Men from the South and men from the North quickly streamed into Kansas to try to take over the majority that would vote for statehood as either slave state or a free state. And civil war broke out, guerrilla warfare broke out. And guerrilla warfare from 1854 to 1860 plagued the border between the western border between Missouri and Kansas. There's a family story that I'll share with you very briefly. It's been handed down in my family because my family lived in Missouri and came from Missouri. Even though I am a native Californian, my ancestors all came from the western part of Missouri. Turns out that we know that in almost every generation in my family, reaching back as far as we have any records, there's been a school teacher. And in the early 1850s, an ancestor of mine by the name of Marquis, Claude Marquis, was a school teacher in a small town in the western part of Missouri. Like most school teachers in those days, he was one of the few men in the community that had a library of any size. And uh, he had a fairly significant uh, set of library books of which he was very proud and which he used in his teaching. Bands of marauders that formed in Kansas and then formed to, to fight against them in Missouri were some of the first guerrilla fighters in the United States. In Kansas, they were called the Kansas Red Legs, and in Missouri, they were called the Bushwhackers but they were really gangs of marauders attacking and killing and burning and pillaging and doing things that uh, were uh, today we would, would call guerrilla warfare. Well, a band of Candace Red Redlegs showed up at my ancestor's home and told him to get out. They were gonna burn the home down. According to the family story, he protested, don't burn my library. Well, as somebody who has a library, I can really understand what my ancestor felt. And apparently, they got so mad at what he was doing that they tied him up in his library and were going to burn the house down with him. When a neighbor came along just at the right moment, talked them out of burning up my ancestor in his library, let him go, but they burned down the house and the library anyway. Now, I don't know whether that story that's handed down is actually true. I've never been able to confirm it, but certainly the, the problem in this area that occurred in the days leading up to the Civil War were terrible. And I only mention that to point out that 
the concept of, of internal conflict is going to be a part of our story that we see in California very shortly. Let's go to the next slide. I mentioned that the second election that was the most, the second most explosive in American history was that of November 1860. And of course, the winner of the election was on the screen, Abraham Lincoln. Whether rightly or wrongly, the South firmly believed that if Lincoln became president, that he would eventually abolish slavery in the South, or at the very least, prohibit its expansion into the new territories that they believe themselves entitled to. And as a result, South Carolina in December of 1860, only one month after the popular election, voted to cancel uh, the Act of Union, which they had originally passed to join the United States and to secede from the Union. And they were followed in short order by other states in the South and then by April of 1861 to the formation of a new United States of America for the South called the Confederate States of America. That's a headline from a newspaper from December of 1860. The Union is dissolved. And it wasn't really clear in December of 1860 whether or not uh, that was going to be permanent. We had yet to see what the new administration of Abraham Lincoln would do or could do. And from the farther reaches of the Pacific coast, the, the state of California was watching this, a new state of only 10 years existence. This is a picture that I found of San Francisco in 1860, where the part of our story with Thomas Starr King really begins. And notice the, the San Francisco Bay with the ships out there and the wooden houses and things like that. It pr probably looked very much like that when Thomas Starr King arrived in the summer of 1860 in San Francisco. Let me now talk a little bit about who Thomas Starr King was and how he ended up in San Francisco in the first place. Thomas Starr King was a preacher, a minister. He belonged to a Protestant denomination called the Universalists and the Universalists were uh, very close in theology to another very prominent American Protestant denomination, the Unitarians. This is one of several emblems of the now combined or conjoined uh, uh, Unitarian Universalist Church. And you may see this on uh, some of their church publications and places like that. The Unitarians part of this uh, double uh, religious group grew out of the New England Puritans, the Congregationalists. And they were called Unitarians because they believed in, uh, or maybe I should say disbelieved in the concept of the Trinity. Uh, they were a very liberal leaning religious group, very rationalist, and they held uh, a strong position in New England. Their close associates, the uh, Universalists, often shared the same pulpits. And Thomas Stark King was a prominent Unitarian Universalist uh, minister in Boston, held one of the prime churches in Boston when this story begins. Now, in 1860, there was a congregation of Universalists in San Francisco, and they called Thomas Starr King to be their minister. And he traveled from Boston across the United States, a long journey to take up his position as the minister of the First Unitarian Church of San Francisco. That church is still in existence. And Thomas Starr King is buried next door to that church in San Francisco, not at the same site where the tomb originally was because the church in Thomas Starr King's time was located on Union Square on the north side of Union Square. The present church is located at 1187 Franklin Street and in the courtyard or on the south side of the church is the tomb of Thomas Starr King. 
in 2014, I had the great privilege of joining with the Grand Master of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of California to jointly lay a wreath on or at the tomb of Thomas Starr King. And I'll tell you just a moment why it was so momentous, not only for me as a California Mason, but also for the Prince Hall Masons who joined in this event. I want to digress just a moment to pick up a bit of history that is background for what I'll be telling you next. The California State Capitol was under construction after we had decided that Sacramento would be the capital of California. And on May 15, 1861, the Grand Lodge of California laid the cornerstone of the California State Capitol. When I was Grand Master, I had the privilege of reenacting that ceremony on the Capitol grounds. And in preparation for that, I had the opportunity to research what we knew about the Grand Master at the time and this particular ceremony. In fact, the proceedings of the Grand Lodge of California for 1861 had and still have a detailed description of that day. I was very privileged to be able to give a copy of those proceedings to the California State Historic Capital Commission. They did not know very much about the ceremony and were completely unaware that Masons of California had details of which they were entirely ignorant of this important day. So it goes to show you that some of our Masonic things can be of valuable value to the larger ones. In doing my research for that, I found in our proceedings the address that the Grand Master Nathaniel Green Curtis gave on May 15, 1861. Now, just for a moment, before I share the words with you, I want you to look at the date. December before 1860, South Carolina had seceded from the Union. In April of 1861, the Confederacy was now in full flower in the South and the Civil War had begun with a bombardment in Charleston, South Carolina, Fort Sumter. Only a month later, far from all of those events, the Masonic Grand Lodge of California itself, only 11 years old, lays the cornerstone of the California State Capitol. When I read these words, it brought some thoughts to mind that I'll share with you in a moment, but let me read it. May this building be speedily completed. May symmetry and order rest upon each line and curve. May strength and beauty characterize each arch and pillar. And may the grandeur of its proportions attract the admiration and gladden the heart of every lover of order and progress. And from its lofty dome, May the glorious ensign of our country, without one single star dimmed or blotted out, wave proudly and triumphantly forever and ever. There were 34 stars, of course, in the United States flag and other pictures, photographs that we have of this occasion show that. But it tells you very clearly that the leader of California Freemasonry on this occasion is expressing the hope that the rebellion in the South will not succeed and that no star will ever be taken from the flag of the United States, which was now flying over this new Capitol building for California. Let me move back now to 1863 and 1864 and Thomas Starr King. I previously told you that he had been called and had come to California to serve as the minister of the Unitarian Church in San Francisco. He came to San Francisco in 18, July of 1816 and very quickly established himself as a prominent citizen of this uh, city on the Pacific Coast. He was known as a prominent orator before uh, he came to California, and in February of 1861, uh, on the uh, occasion of celebrating the birthday of 
George Washington on February 22, addressed a, a crowd of almost 2,000 in San Francisco. So obviously a very famous character in person. And in 1861, he presented a petition to a lodge in San Francisco to become a Mason. That lodge was Oriental Lodge number 144. It's currently Phoenix Lodge number 144. I happen to be a member of that lodge as well and very proud to be associated with them. They've had many other prominent Californians as members of that lodge down through the years, including the founder of the California public school system. But probably their most famous was Thomas Starr King. He must have seen something in Freemasonry that echoed with his passionate belief that American, the American freedoms that had been created with the beginning of our country and which were now threatened by a great civil war were something that would add to his ability to understand that. Well, our Grand Lodge recognized that because in 1863, just two years after that, we asked him to become the Grand Orator of the Grand Lodge of California. In those days, to be a Grand Orator, you did not have to be a past master of your lodge. So he had not served as master of Oriental Lodge number 144, but he was asked to become our Grand Orator. If you look on the left, this is our first monumental building that the Grand Lodge built in California. It is the ancestor of our present building at 1111 California Street. It was destroyed in the uh, 1906 earthquake in San Francisco. But at the time it was built, it was an absolutely magnificent building. Thomas Starr King delivered his first grand oration in this new building. And the proceedings of 1863, uh, which you can still get a copy of PDF for the Grand Lodge website, the Grand Master references in his remarks that this is the first time that the Grand Lodge is meeting in its brand new building. This and the next slide is an excerpt from his Grand Oration. Now, if you heard our Grand Order deliver his Grand Oration this last Saturday, you know what a Grand or uh, Oration is or, and is supposed to be. It's a way of expressing the feelings of all Masons at the time, saying the things that, that the Grand Order believes that each Mason would say and believe. And because it applies to our ongoing and developing story of Thomas Starr King, I wanted you to take a look at it. It was much longer than this, of course. So I just pulled out a very short one. Whatever will teach our people reverence, decorum, respect for others in the utterance and defense of opinion, submission to constituted authority with dignity and grace will be medicine for our trouble and will prepare us for a better future. I believe that the order of masonry, the quiet efficiency of its organism, the regard for forms it fosters, the love of order it induces and deepens, the graceful habits of submission it educates, and the sacredness it pours around organic law and the seats of authority are a prominent portion of the bonds of civilization in our country and an immense blessing when we consider our natural perils. How good and how precious it is for brethren to dwell together in such unity. May it continue brothers and widen through our fidelity and service and beneficence. God preserve our organization, guard our order, inspire our beneficence and grant that a century hence, our successors may meet here to enjoy in a larger fellowship, the result of our faithfulness and within a nation not sundered, but presided over by one Grand Master, heir of the virtues, the hope, and the blessing of George Washington. And I would suggest to you that um, if he came back today, 
I think he would be impressed at how Freemasonry has echoed what he called our attention to and what we are doing in California. But I will leave that for your own thoughts. I mentioned Prince Hall. And many of you know that our Grand Lodge finally established mutual recognition with the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of California in 1995. I had the privilege of participating in the events leading up to that and the final recognition ceremony itself when I was Grand Secretary. At the time, I did not know the role that Thomas Starr King had played in Prince Hall Freemasonry. I didn't find that out until I was preparing for the joint wreath laying with the Prince Hall Grand Lodge in 2014 that, uh, that I put together. There were two Prince Hall Lodges in San Francisco in 1861, Hannibal Lodge number one and Victoria Lodge number three, and both are still in existence. In those days, mainstream Masons did not recognize Prince Hall Masons as Masons. And yet, Thomas Starr King met with the Masons of both of those lodges as recorded in their minutes and tradition to talk to them about how they could contribute to keeping California as a part of the union, despite the civil war that was tearing the country apart. Now that should tell you, of course, that Thomas Starr King's commitment to what he believed were the ideals of Freemasonry were tantamount to what he saw at perhaps as the unfair rules that Masons sometimes place on themselves when they should have, if you will, better thoughts about it. And apparently at the time, no one said a, a single thing about the fact that he wanted to meet with these men of color in San Francisco to talk about his greatest effort that was to carry him to the end of his life in 1864. And that was to keep California in the union. Because you see, many Californians were not of the same opinion as to whether or not the South should have left the Union. We had many, many men in California who had come from the Southern states. And although California prohibited slavery in its first constitution of 1849, there were many, many Californians who believed fervently that California should in fact have become a slave state instead primarily concentrated in Southern California, but actually all over the state, this was a problem. Thomas Starr King set out to use his incredible powers of oratory to persuade Californians to stay as a part of the union. And he traveled all over California during the time between 1861 and his death in 1864, speaking in public, urging Californians, pointing out that the blessings of liberty were more important, were absolutely paramount, and that the United States as a new nation amongst the citizens of the world could not be put under, if you will, by giving in to those that would enslave other people. And we still have many of his orations that appeared in local newspapers. Researchers have found them. I have a collection in my library. He was absolutely a passionate and, and firm individual, but I didn't know until 2014 that he had actually um, met with Masons of these two lodges in San Francisco to promote what he considered to be the, the cause of his life. And there's a picture of California at the time, um, a big state, a diverse state, and historians know that it came very close to either joining the South or declaring itself an independent republic on the Western shore, as Texas once had been an independent republic that would have become an ally of the Confederacy. I gave you a picture here, of course, of our current California flag. And you know that came from the Bear Flag Revolt during the war with Mexico and the and the years before, or the year before, uh, two years that, uh, well, actually 1846, for 
before California became a state. But this undoubtedly, or some version of this would have become the flag had California become an independent republic at the time. I want to close off tonight by pointing out something that most of us had the opportunity as grade school kids to memorize the Gettysburg Address. It was delivered on November 19, 1863. And since we are on the internet tonight, and this is a uh, Zoom uh, broadcast and technology is a part of what we're doing, I thought it might be interesting to, to close with a bit about technology. California became a state in 1850, but it took a long time for news to come from the east to California and to go from California to the east. Just by way of comparison, in 1841, before California became a state, when President William Henry Harrison died, it took 110 days for that news to reach Los Angeles. Things were materially better by the time we got to 1860. If you remember your history, between April 3, 1860 and October 24, 1861, the Pony Express connected California with uh, St. Joseph, Missouri. And it took 10 days at that point for information to travel from the westernmost settled part of the United States to California and back. October 24, 1861 was the end of the Pony Express. And the reason was quite simple. It was on that date that the first telegraph line reached from California up through Carson, Nevada and Salt Lake City and on to connect it with the hub uh, on the edge of Missouri and through there to connect to the rest of the telegraph network of those days. We've forgotten that the telegraph was really the internet of that period in American history. I call this to your attention because the efforts that Thomas Starr King was making during this time period was also the time in which for the very first time news of the Civil War and all the things that were happening there, including President Lincoln's November 19 Gettysburg Address could reach California instantly by telegraph. The following March, Thomas Starr King died, exhausted with diphtheria and uh, shattered physically. He died in San Francisco. Still, the grand orator of the Masonic Grand Lodge of California, although he was never to deliver a second address to our Grand Lodge at its following annual communication. To return to the beginning of the story, the bronze statue you can still see in the area in Capitol Park outside of the California State Capitol. I'm personally very proud that a California Mason, in the words of Abraham Lincoln, was responsible for keeping California in the Union. And I hope tonight to have shown you how all of that came about. Thank you. Worshipful Roberto, do we have any uh, questions coming in? Yes, I just needed to. Am I on right now? Yep, you're live. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, most worshipful. That that was awesome. Uh, listening to you, it's always so entertaining. Uh, you make any history lesson just that more enjoyable. I, I I think I can vouch for everyone to say that that was enjoyed immensely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, worshipful. Um, let's see, uh, just want to inform the brethren, um, if you will, uh, direct your attention to the bottom of the, 
of your screen. Um, if you wish to direct a question to our speaker, you can either click on the chat box and submit it, or you can click on the raised hand feature. I believe there's also a QA feature there. Um, so there's several options if you wanna submit a question to our uh, most worshipful orator tonight. Uh, rest assured that if your question does not get answered tonight, uh, it will be saved and it will be forwarded to our presenter. <clears throat> I have a question here. Um, most worshipful, you had mentioned um, on your flyer that there was a statue of Brother Thomas Starr King that was displayed in the statuary hall in our nation's capital until 2009. Right. I believe that was controversial when it was returned to California. Uh, do you mind sharing your thoughts regarding what led to a statue being replaced by another, especially back in 2009? Part of the problem with statues is that they, they evoke uh, memories at a time in which they are placed and history moves on. Uh, it's been a lot of in the last year or so, a lot of controversy about statues of the Confederacy and I won't get into that, but I will tell you that uh, not everyone agrees that statues represent things, especially as time moves on and new thoughts come about. In the case of Thomas Starr King, it was pretty evident that by the 2006, that the California State Legislature, or at least the, those that were our legislators at the time, did not really have an idea as to who Thomas Starr King really was. And the assemblyman who sponsored the bill to replace Thomas Starr King's statue with that of President Ronald Reagan uh, made the comment on the floor, um, I don't even know who Thomas Starr King was and I don't suppose anybody else in this room does either. Um, well, that illustrates that history isn't always carried forward. Uh, even as a high school history teacher, I don't think that I really ever spent any time on that kind of an issue. I was aware of Thomas Starr King, but things move on. And certainly by 2006, the legislature felt that a more prominent Californian than Thomas Starr King ought to represent us in Statuary Hall. At that time, um, Junipero Serra was not as controversial as he is now. So maybe that statue is gonna, if you will, be returned to California, I don't know. But that was the feeling with that. Um in addition to that question, who, who was it replaced, the, the statue, Thomas Starr King's statue, with whom was it replaced? It was replaced with President Ronald Reagan. Okay, thank you. We have another question here. Um, what was the California legislature's opinions about, the, about supporting the union, or was it just mainly the Freemasons? No, the legislature was as divided as the rest of the state was. Uh, we have had from the beginning uh, of the state of California, 80 assemblymen and 40 senators. And they represented the people in California. And of course, some of them represented in, uh, people in a, an area that were pro-Southern. Some represented people in an area that were pro-Union. Uh, they did not have enough votes to secede from the union. I have never researched the, um, the proceedings of uh, the state of California legislative proceedings to know if any actual votes took place on that issue. That would be an interesting uh, thing to pursue one of these days because of course all those records are available electronically and uh, to find out if any bills were actually introduced but voted down. One of the key things of course was California's gold and that was of great interest because having sufficient funds was a perpetual problem for the Confederacy. And that was also a part of the situation with the sale of cotton, with the Union blockade. There were many issues with that, that California either uh, being an independent country, but favorable to the Confederacy or one of the Confederate states would have resolved because gold from California could have helped the Confederate cause immensely. 
Thank you, Worshipful. Uh, we do have some members uh, that have raised their hand and wish to provide a question directly to you. Worshipful Marty, if you could. Yes, Worshipful, which one would you like to call on first? I'm sorry. Uh, if you can, if you see uh, uh, Worshipful Brother Jim Durkee on there, Jim is an expert on this for Phoenix Lodge. And so it might be good to, if you can uh, call on him and ask him to share some of the information about uh, Thomas Star King and Phoenix Lodge or Oriental 144 as it was then. I know he's on the, on the feed. We have brother, let's see, right now we have brother John Palmer. Let's... Uh... Um, worst of all, let, let's go with uh, James first since he was here. I'll ask okay. him to unmute. And uh, Brother James, you can go ahead and ask your question. Is he still with us? Yeah, while we figure out this um, technical thing, um, why don't you call in another person? We have Brother John Palmer. Brother Palmer, if you could join in. Um, Worshipful, I, I believe that's just a question that came in. You can go ahead and read it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, did Brother King have a family here in California, and did they stay here after his passing and continue his good works? I would have to hand that question off to um, Jim Durkee because I've never looked at um, any of, of those details. It didn't, didn't come across them in 2014. Uh, Jim could probably tell you. You can find a way to bring him in. We have a question, another question here from uh, Brother Andrew Stock. Uh, we have had three very divided elections, including the one coming up. Can you speak more about that or possible role, if any, as Masons? Uh, I believe firmly that Freemasonry has tools that the larger society could well benefit from if they use them. I happen to be privileged to be a part of the Masonic Civility uh, Task Force which is headed up by past, uh, our, our past Grand Master Russ Chervonia. We have developed things out of Freemasonry on the issue of civility. One of the key problems of most democratic countries is that when they get themselves divided on issues that they cease to listen to one another, they cease to talk to one another, they cease to respect one another's opinions. Freemasonry is known for its ability to do that and just reflect upon the fact that how we conduct ourselves in a Masonic Lodge when properly conducted, the respect we show to the presiding officer of that Lodge, the respect we show to other members by listening and not interrupting them is all a part of our culture and the Masonic civility movement is working to bring that to the larger world. So yes, I think that any time that political society becomes heavily polarized, that we would be well served as Masons to take the tools that we know work so well and help others adopt them. And we've been successful in several of our workshops around the country, including a, a, a large uh, conference at the George Washington Memorial two years ago that um, we think was a very positive contribution to things our country needs. Thank you, Worshipful. I think we may have time for maybe two more questions, if you could, please. Uh, brother uh, brother uh, John, this is Jim Durkee. Uh, to answer your question, uh, Thomas Star King's family did come west with him. Uh, they remained here. His son um, was instrumental with working uh, on the development of the Sierra Club. And as we all know, or should know, Thomas Star King wrote 18 books in his short life. And uh, 
was instrumental in uh, writing a petition to Abraham Lincoln to declare Yosemite Valley to be a national monument. Here, here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is Bruce Bush. Can I get a next? Have a question? Yes, please. Go ahead, brother. Uh, John, I'm thinking back, thinking back about, uh, wait a minute. The, um, back to the issue of the, of the statue with the um, other statue that we have up in, in Washington, that of Unipus Vera, uh, as you're probably aware, that's a controversial thing right there because a lot of people then are uh, not recognizing the kinds of things that Unipus Vera were, was uh, <laughs> attributed to do in a positive way and begin to emphasize the things that he perhaps did in a more negative way. And so I'm wondering, uh, in your opinion, how long it might be before somebody will decide how to replace that statue with somebody better? Well, Bruce, I, I think I would wait out into the political thicket. And since Freemasonry tries not to do that on partisan politics or sectarian religion, I'm going to pass on that. <laughs> just simply point out that uh, the placement of statues is always a, or almost always, a political decision if you're going to put it in a public place and you run the liability that history sometimes may overrun you. Well, all we have, all we have to do is see how many statues have been removed and destroyed just within the last few years. So that, that uh, verifies the point that you've made. I don't believe that. Yeah. Thank you, guys. John, I really enjoyed that. Thank you very much. Uh, a lot of new information that I didn't have, and I'm very happy to have. Thank you. We have a question from Brother Don. Um, how can we as Masons follow the example of King and promote civil dialogue and unity in our nation today, given recent violence? kidnapping attempt, et cetera. To refer back to the Masonic Civility Project, one of the things that we have done is to set up workshops uh, in cooperation with community organizations and sometimes local uh, city councils or other groups of that. I believe you really have to start at the local level. I think that you have to have people understand that there are differing ways of not agreeing on things that do not tear your community apart. And I'm very proud of the fact that Freemasons who have been engaged in this have had success with that. Um, you can just uh, do a search on the web for Masonic Civility and it'll quickly bring up the website of the organization. And if you have an interest in learning more about it, there we can certainly connect you with some Masons who are very involved in that. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, great lecture. Um, thank you, Worshipful. And um, I think there is one question by our my inspector, and I better make sure I include it. Um, Worshipful Chris, if you want to just basically ask the question yourself, I appreciate that. Thanks, Worshipful. Yeah, most worshipful John, I, I have to add all the kudos to everyone else. Every time I listen to a lecture from you, it seems easy. It seems very much just this is stream of consciousness thought out. Anyway, I wanted to say that. So as you were talking about Prince Hall Lodge and the Prince Hall Lodge's you know, process to recognition, this year we had most worshipful Teresita from the Women's Grand Lodge of California as part of one of our speaker sessions. I wonder if you could comment, share whatever your thoughts are about co-Masons and uh -huh. women Masons. I know it's another sort of political thicket, but anything that you would care to share, I'd be very interested to hear. I'm very proud of the fact that California has been a leader in reaching out to the larger world of Freemasonry. Reaching out does not necessarily mean that we 
need to share tile sessions does not necessarily mean that we have all the same views of things, but it is an extension of our Masonic values of respect for others. Uh, if you recall, we have had um, a prominent speaker from the Grand Orient of France uh, on our stage when we had the California Masonic Symposium. We have had representatives from other Grand Lodges around the world that follow a different path in Freemasonry. And our belief in California, I think is, is that we have much to learn from others and less perhaps to spend time with our own views on things. Uh, and I respect what our Grand Lodge has continued to do uh, since I retired as Grand Secretary. I'm very proud of that. Thank you, Most Worshipful. Thank you, Most Worshipful. Again, um, thank you for agreeing to being here this evening and providing us with, again, another fantastic presentation. I'm just echoing what we've already said. It's always a pleasure listening to you, truly. Uh, before we retire this evening, there's one more thing we would like to do for you. Brethren, as you may or may not be aware, this past weekend was California's 171st annual communication. And our most worshipful brother, John, was honored with the Grand Master's Lifetime Achievement Award. Well done, brother, well done, congratulations. We, as Burlingham Lodge number 400, would like to all also honor you in our own lodge, in your lodge, with this frame photo. which with your permission, we will proudly display in our past master's hall. Uh, most worshipful, you have been a member of Burlingame Lodge number 400 for 29 years and a past grand master. We felt that you should have a special place in our past master's hall where we proudly display and honor all of our lodges past masters. The inscription at the bottom reads, most worshipful John Lilborn Cooper III 148th Grand Master, Grand Lodge of Masons of California, 2013, 2014, Burlingham Lodge number 400. Well, thank you very much, Worshipful. Well, that is indeed an honor, and I'm very proud of my association with Burlingham 400. Thank you. Little technical difficulty here, if I may. I would like to also give special thanks, thanks for all the support to our team in the back end, which made this evening's presentation possible. Worshipful Brother Marty Cousing and Brother Chris Advincula, thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Brethren, thank you for being here with us tonight, and I look forward to having you join us again for our future speakers. Our next, our next guest speaker is Worshipful Brother jo Jordan Jelinek, who will be presenting Freemasonry in the 21st century. He's scheduled for November 10th at 7 p.m. and on December 8th, we will have Worshipful Brother Douglas Russell presenting the Exoteric Art of Memory. The flyer with instructions on how to register will be forthcoming. Brethren, stay well, stay safe, and have a great evening. Have a good night.